So welcome, Apendra. Uh, today we'll be talking with Apendra Martikar. Apendra is a seasoned professional and information security leader with past positions at Visa, PayPal, and American Express. Apendra has a unique point of view on cybersecurity, compliance, and application security as it relates to the fintech industry. Apendra has 95 plus patents issued and some pending patents in various stages as, as related to information security and cybersecurity. Uh, I believe you spent almost eight years over at PayPal and served as a director of, inform of security architecture before moving back to Visa to a similar position and then occupying the role of uh, VP information security and strategy over at American Express. Uh, about six months ago, you decided to change base and move to a startup company in the fintech uh, space called Snap Finance. Um, I usually have two icebreaker questions here. One is about your marital status and the other one is about your favorite drink. Uh, can you tell me anything about uh, your marital status? Absolutely, Ben. First of all, thank you so much for having me. This is a pleasure and uh, you know really looking forward to this uh, podcast um, i'm married happily married i have uh, one daughter as well and uh, my favorite drink i'm you know obviously i like coffee i like tea but you know most favorite is water where i gravitate to really because you know uh most of the CISOs I know their favorite drink is probably around whiskey single malt <laughs> of some sort so I'm just collecting, you know, I'm, I'm doing like a poll, a survey. And, um, and actually I was about to ask you about Snap Finance uh, because I think it's a relatively uh, young startup. I might be mistaken here. So if you want to give a few words about that. Absolutely. So Snap Finance is a POS non-card lending platform. And what this company does is uh, it's in the space of B and PL, which is an emerging space in the fintech world, which is buy now, pay later. And they, they have loan products and we have, uh, you know, LTO, which is we call a leasing option. So we're leased to buy. So a customer can go get an appliance or get mattress, uh, you know. So one of the things, the reason I joined this particular company is that there are lots of uh, people and I will be, I was shocked when there were 60% of US population, they fall in this prime subprime category. And most of these people, they don't have money uh, to get the necessary appliances or get necessary mattress and all that kind of stuff. So if they run into issues, you know, in their lives and their hardships, uh, there's tons of money uh, that people charge. So there is an altruistic angle to Snap Finance where we help these people um, who are going through some hardships and it's a, a pretty humane company. And it, there is a satisfaction of giving back as well as protecting the customer as well. So that is the space BNPL and uh, we do point of sale non-card lending. Okay, point of sale non-card lending. That's interesting. And your um, main target market, is it like retail in the retail space? That is correct. So we target retail and we target cars and parts and jewelry as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this company operates uh, in the US alone or is it a global company? So this company operates in US and UK um, and uh, we have an office in Costa Rica as well. Nice. Well, it's, uh, it definitely sounds like a challenge, but I mean, it's, it's an interesting space. And I think the payment uh, industry right now is evolving, right? And you, someone who spent so many years over at Visa and Amex, I'm sure you know about these changes much more than I do. Uh, you know, everything from uh, contactless pay payment and the EMV move that was going on, like, maybe eight years back, if I'm not mistaken, and, and a lot of changes around uh, around payment since I got into this space like 11 years ago. Uh, okay. That is yeah. 
Interesting, interesting. So, you know, and as, as we've discussed uh, before, uh, you know, this is a very level conversation here. It's an eye level conversation. My main goal is to uh, to get to know you better, for our listeners to get to know you better, to understand a bit more about the person behind the role. Um, so, and, and this is one of the reasons I ask those icebreaker questions as well. I will be asking you, uh, you know, a few might, what might feel like personal questions. If you have any, you know, any issue with any of those questions, just let me know. Uh, feel completely free and safe here. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go on to ask a bunch of other questions, mostly around like how it is you perceive information security, uh, goals and vendor relationship and, uh, and some related questions to that. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I always like to start with one question that I ask the CISOs I'm interviewing. Uh, and that is, what's the one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Yeah, <clears throat> so I have been a technologist throughout my career. I still look at the code. I do lots, lots of code reviews at work. And I also write code at home. So as I progress, when I began my career, essentially, I emphasized primarily on my technical proficiency more than the non-technical elements, uh, which is more like soft skills, right? Uh, it's absolutely it's absolutely critical for one to keep pushing ourselves towards uh, you know more like heroic efforts. Though I know the you know had I known the importance of soft skills, the business communication skills earlier in my career, I would have been a better employee and contributor to the organization. So essentially, uh, that's what uh, you know uh, is my focus. Of that, that I, I should have known earlier. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, in recent interviews, I heard uh, the following probably four or five times just for the past in the past two weeks. Yeah. One CISO told me, you know, it's all about the people. Another one told me, um, I was very focused on technology, and what I should have been focused on is, you know, learn how to manage and how to work with people. So this is, you know, definitely becoming a theme here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and you know, I the CISO, right? I mean, that is one of the soft skills. Is something that insecurity is so critical, and we will talk more about it. Um, but the soft skill is one of the most important things that uh, any security professional should be focusing on. Yes, and uh, and I agree. And I think I think more than that, you know, traditionally speaking, CISOs have grown traditionally from IT. You know, they start as IT, and you know, some of them maybe along the way uh, migrated from like uh, development uh, associated roles. But I think um, I think if you if you look at at the CISO position like ten years ago, it was much more of a, you know it was more around fry tactics and being the bad guy in the organization. And I think nowadays a CISO, as you as I'm sure you'll agree, a CISO is you know it's it's a C level role. It reports to the to the business. It needs to work with the business and not against the business. And you know, I think in one of the companies I worked in maybe 15 years ago, they came up with a phrase, uh, security as a business enabler. And I think nowadays it's just, it's the industry best practice or, or what it should be actually. So yeah, I, th I think that's one of the reasons that I, I keep hearing like those answers. Uh, and, and, you know, I know you've spent a lot of times in large corporates uh, and I'm sure you had a lot of challenges and a lot of accomplishment, but what would you say was your biggest accomplishment was? Yeah, so like, uh, you know, you correctly said, my team and I, you know, we have delivered several projects uh, throughout my career, right? And we contributed to protecting these financial giants like Amex, we signed PayPal, and, and I was very privileged to be serving these big brands. And, you know, I personally, like you correctly said, I have 95 plus past patents that are issued and pending. Um, though the biggest accomplishment uh, I feel 
is the fulfillment, right? So is when I give, uh, I grew with my team and created an environment that fostered innovation and challenged the security folks to be, don't be naysayer, like you were saying, right? I mean, security being a business enabler. So how can we look at the art of possible to come up with new solutions? So typically what happens is that whenever a product comes up with some crazy ideas and an immediate knee-jerk reaction is, nope, that is insecure. So how do we pause ourselves, not go on offense and really try to understand the business, come up with an art of possible things that, hey, there are creative ways of solving these security issues and don't be a naysayer. So that was the mantra actually. And uh, to, to your point, being a business enabler and contributing to these organizations is one of the biggest accomplishments. And this is a cultural shift then, then in the sense that how the organizations, the security organizations think, um, and it's always right, I mean, us versus them. So actually supporting products, supporting business, and not fostering this culture of naysayer is one of the biggest accomplishments, I say. Yeah, and you know what? I think um, maybe 12, 13 years ago, my co-founder actually over at GRC told me that he was also uh, acting as a CISO for a few years in a large, uh, large organization. And I think he told me, you never say no to the business. You always say yes. But th but these are the implications. This is what we need to do in order to make this secure. Or, you know, if you want to assume the risk, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's a, it's a strong point here. And it's, it's a very important point that I, I believe my, you know, some younger CISOs might not, I mean, might take some time to grasp with that. So, and, and, and I'm, you know, we've spoken about your biggest accomplishments and I'm sure you had a lot of challenges as well. Uh, but, but what advice would you want to give to someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Yeah, there are two concrete advices, uh, I, I, you know, or points that I would like for, uh, you know, somebody who is pursuing this career to consider. Again, not in a preachy way, but more like as a friendly advice, if you will. The first thing is <clears throat> security, you know, is a very complex science and engineering problem, right? It's a purely technical problem. So, you know, put your technology hat while you are solving the security uh, problems and look at it from the science as well as engineering. It's not purely an engineering problem. It's also a science problem. The second advice and consideration will be to communicate security as a business problem. So these, that is how security is, is, is a pretty unique in that way, in the sense that we have to solve it as a science and engineering problem, aka a technology problem, and then communicate as a business problem. Can you elaborate a bit for my sake? Uh, what do you mean when you say uh, security is a science problem? Can you can yeah. you touch a bit? Yeah. So so basically, what happens is that um, when there are solutions, right? The solutions can lie in data science. The solution can lie in how you know. For, for example, let me give you a concrete example for the customer identity and security, which is one of the things that is close to my heart. How do you know in a digital world when your customer is logging to your site in an e-commerce setting or even you know, with, for your www website, how do you know that on the other side there is actually a customer or somebody impersonating a customer or if there is a bot, right? So let's say it's a bot. An engineer, what engineer will write code, maybe JavaScript or whatnot, right? But there is lots of science that comes behind that particular problem 
when it relates to behavioral biometrics, when it comes to digital fingerprinting, when it comes to really understanding whether uh, the customer who is entering the username and the password with MFA is not a bot because the bots behave in a certain way. So it becomes a data science problem at that particular point. The second concrete example is that when you are doing net flows and data flows, and when you're trying to do user behavioral analytics, you know, inside of the network, very similar, uh, it becomes a science problem. And then from the engineering perspective, you code to it. So that's why uh, security is a very, very technical, very science and engineering problem, very much so. But when you are explaining it to the business, you have to, uh, you know, come up with a language where whether you talk like a duck, when you walk like a duck, you are a duck. So you become more like a business person as to what kind of business problems you are trying to solve. But and underneath, it's a primarily a technical scientific science and engineering problem. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yes, it uh, doesn't. It uh, certainly makes sense. And you know, we've like in some of your examples, I know there are relatively a few, again, relatively new startup companies in that space. Some of them are even considered unicorns. I think one of them that might be dealing with some of the challenges that you described is probably Cyber Reason. Uh, and I know there are a lot of other companies in that space as well, uh, all doing a fine job. And, but yeah, but I mean, I, I just, I've never heard, you know, uh, another CISO um, describe security as a science problem. So this is why I wanted to drill down into that. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and, um, and I believe that, you know, uh, in some of your previous roles as a CISO, you were uh, part of the IT organization, right? And this is a question I always like to ask and frequent because, you know, like, by the book, CISO should not report to to anyone in IT, you know, but, but that's by the book, right? And a lot of CISOs that I've been talking to told me, look, it's, uh, I mean, some of them told me, yeah, we, we, we do not report to the IT and this is how it should work. Others said just the opposite. And, and I just, I, I wanted your take on that. Well, what's your, what do you feel about the role of CISO as part of the IT? Yeah. So when you say IT, right, I mean, you actually meant technology, first of all, right? Because IT yes. is a very small part of the oral technology organization. Now, uh, the, it depends on the organization. When, when I have seen all these big organizations where CISO is part of the technology organization. And there are multiple reasons for that. Again, you know, it goes back to security being a very technical problem, right? And it's one of the most complex, uh, you know, uh, fields, if not the com most complex field. So, you know, one of the thoughts is that because it is a technology problem, you are influencing more of the technologists in the organization than other side of the business. Now, it is... Uh, it is also a business problem in the sense that organizations are going to do injustice to themselves when they see CISOs just as a part of IT or just as a part of technology, right? It has become a business level problem now. And, you know, not having a visibility at the board, it's very difficult for any CISO to make, the, you know, their organization uh, successful. So what CISO, the way at least there are, I categorize the CISOs as four types of CISOs, right? So the first type of CISOs, they primarily come from legal background and these kinds of CISOs, I have seen them reporting into the CFO chain. The second type of CISOs, they come from mainly operations background. So what has happened is that they, uh, try to, um, you know, they have done some network level firewalls, they have configured routers, they have configured Linuxes. And what these guys do is they, um, uh, they grew into the organization, mainly operational CISOs, and then they run, op uh, you know, CISO as an operations person. And then everything becomes an operational 
you know, organization. The third generation or third types of CISOs are, they came, come from software development background, who is kind of, who writes code, they have written algorithms, they have written, you know, hardware security modules, and they have written lots of identity and access management, and, you know, the key management and all that, and they come into being a CISO and they grew, grew as a CISO. And then the fourth category, and that is where the science element comes to the picture, where there it becomes more like an artificial intelligence or data scientist, right? So, and some engineers who straddle, who go and grow into being a data science. So that is the third to fourth type of uh, CISOs. Um, if you look at all these different types of CISOs, right? Primarily, the person who comes from the legal background, uh, you know, th there is obviously a disconnect between the technology organization and the uh, uh, non-technology CISOs. Yes. So I, yeah. So I, I personally think that to really make an impact on the floor right to really make an impact on the floor it's important for the CISO to be part of technology so that the technology can be influenced again it depends on the organization if you can influence the technology organization sitting outside absolutely you know the right thing to do but if your CTO for example has a vested interest then it makes sense um, for the organization to be reporting into the technology organization. Um, but the, there has to be a visibility for the CISO across board, across other businesses, across other products, because security is an organizational problem. It's not just a technology problem. Yeah, uh, well, th that was a very comprehensive answer, and uh, I tend to agree with you, you know, on, on most uh, points that you've made, uh, specifically that, you know, it varies from one organization to another, uh, and obviously, you know, you mentioned CISOs growing up to be CISOs from the development, and obviously, that usually happens in large software companies, or, or maybe in the payment industry, right? Uh, and, and, and definitely, you know, I've seen a lot of successful CISOs that were part of IT or, you know, a different technological group, whereas some CISOs are, they work in parallel to the IT organization as well. So, so yeah, but, but that was a very, very, very nice analysis. Thank you. Um, uh, so moving on, what would you say the, what were the best resources that have helped you along the way? Yeah, so I'm a, you know, an avid non-fictional reader, you know, so, and one of the things that I do is whenever I read blogs, I, you know, lots of news, lots of leadership material, I tend to reflect on and take time to reflect on what I read and what I learned from it and how can I apply the knowledge that I gained, gained after reading that. So sorry to those non-fictional readers, uh, you know, but I have, you know, I, I just cannot get past even a few pages of fictional material, right? So I rather, for example, watch a Harry Potter movie than reading those big fat books. I started 45 pages, I zone out, right? Um, uh, it's, it's just the way I am, you know, and sorry to those Harry Potter fans, you know, my daughter is Harry Potter fan, but that's who I am. I try to read those books, but when I read article I ask myself a question non-fictional article as to what portion of this I could apply to me or to my work right mm -hmm. and it's, it becomes very critical for to for me to soak in that material and then apply so that's how I have been uh, yeah, that has helped me a lot you know because learning is is an ongoing process Definitely, uh, we always continue to learn, and this is a uh, you know an ongoing debate I have with my ten-year-old son. He always feels that he learns too much, that he studies too much, and I always tell him, "You never, you never stop." You, I mean, if you think this is too much, just wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you're just ten-year-old. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
and I'm the opposite of you, so I read mostly fictional, uh, either sci-fi or just fictional, fictional literature. But but and I also try to apply whatever I can. Obviously, not everything I read is is applicable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, uh, touching more about resources that have helped you, uh, I always like to ask uh, if you have like three specifically influential people that have influenced you in the past, and if you want to share anything about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, typically all of us, right? I mean, since childhood, we have different people influencing us, right? I mean, obviously when our parents, our, uh, our brothers, our sisters, different people have influenced me just like others, right? In a profound way throughout my life, right? Um, but there are three people I admire most and I aspire to be, actually, to be honest with you. So one of them, and I don't know if you know him, he's uh, Swami Vivekananda. So he's a he was a spiritual leader in India in 1900, 1900th century, around, around 18, you know, 1898, around that time. So the, the, he has some spiritual books over there. And uh, he taught me how to stay spiritual while being in an executive position and look for greater good for humanity. So how do you stay away from all these, you know, things when there are like cyber attacks happening and when there is, you know, lots of um, influencing that happens within the organization, how do you stay away from oneself, right? So, so field of security has an element of giving back to community, you know, and which I admire and which I learned from him. The second thing is, uh, you know, the Sundar Pichai is another person. Uh, yeah, so I haven't directly worked with Sundar, but, you know, one thing that I admire is that arguably he's, he's one of, the, he's head of the, one of the most successful companies in the world history, right? Google, I mean, and arguably, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but it, the way he speaks, right? It seems like ego has not even touched him. He's so humble. So I want to practice being humble. I want to be as respectful. Uh, and I really admire that quality in Sundar. And he influences uh, me. I listen to his YouTube videos. I listen to how he speaks. I mean, it's so down to earth, right? The third person I admire is Elon Musk, and you know there are there are basically m multiple opinions about <laughs> Elon Musk, and I, I really admire him. And here is why, right? So the world can be divided into multiple ways, but there are two planes where people think, right? One is a competitive plane, and another is creative plane. And let me you know give a definition of what competitive plane means. So let's say we are in an organization and you are working on something. If I'm competing for the same resource, same people, same uh, you know uh, things that we are going to develop, there is going to be a conflict within the organization. What Elon Musk thinks is just thinks out of the world and literally, right? I mean, it takes space, SpaceX and nobody would imagine. And he works on this creative plane, if you will. So he's saying the, the way he thinks about it is, hey, I'm not going to work, uh, you know, in, and compete directly in this particular market. I'm going to create something, yeah. right? And that's that's a very different way of change uh, thinking, right? I mean, the way he's solving the climate problems. So I really want to learn a real innovation from Elon Musk. So well, three things, right? I mean, how do you stay away from this and, you know, basically aspire for spiritual growth? How do you make sure that you are being humble? And how do you just work on a creative plane and, uh, you know, to do innovation and do good to the world? So these are the three people who influence me most. Yeah, and, and three people with three completely different uh, takeaways. And, and yeah, that's very profound. And, and Elon Musk, while I'm not, I'm, I doubt he's humble, I do agree that he's, you know, not only creating like new companies, he's creating, as you said, he's not even creating new marketplaces. He's creating like new ways of thinking, like SpaceX, you know, with yeah. the expedition to Mars and uh, Tesla, 
and and before that paypal if i remember correctly right i You're think right. all of them were like game changer and i think he has another one with the um, underground transportation yeah, system boring, boring company. Yeah. Yeah. Boring company. yeah yeah it's definitely it's definitely amazing and i heard that he's um planning on relocating his factory from fremont to to texas i think is that correct yeah there, there have been talks yeah yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, th that's a different story, though. <laughs> uh, Again, I'm not uh, I'm not commenting on on the other attributes. All I was talking about is the creative plane versus competitive plane, and how he is just thinking in a completely different world, right? Yeah. Different plane. That's that was. Yeah, one. it's definitely a key differentiator for him. Uh, so. Is there any like one common myth about your profession that you want to debunk? Security is here to stop me. <laughs> <Nice here. laughs> yeah. So throughout my career, I have seen this, right? And now what happens is that the way it has changed is that I have so many friends, even in product and business outside, they still call me, uh, you know, that is one of the, uh, uh, another accomplishment is they still call me for security advice, right? So ex PayPalian, ex Visa people, ex Amex, they still call me saying that, hey, I'm, these are product people, right? Saying that, hey, how can I secure this? And that, that to me, I, I feel very good, right? I mean, these are friends. So we make friends forever. It's not just limited to those companies. Companies come and go, but friends are there forever. So uh, one common myth is if you're stepping in, being a security, there is no need to be a naysayer and you should not portray yourself as that security is here to stop me. Yeah, I agree with that notion. And you know, coming from, from Israel, uh, some of the CISO, like, well, I wouldn't say old CISOs, but the more mature CISOs in Israel, a lot of them were, military veterans that acted in similar roles in the military and you know as 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 a military veteran uh, being a naysayer is ingrained into the culture right so i think this is why i mean at least in my experience a lot of those were naysayers although i do feel that probably for the past five to seven years i think there's a shift and i think the new generation of CISOs is diff somewhat different yeah. Uh, you know, they talk more about the business, they understand the business, they, they understand the needs. And I do see a shift here, uh, especially if we're talking like C-level executives such as yourself. Um, and I, okay, and I have uh, like uh, one question I like to ask uh, my interviewees about, uh, about what would they do if they were in my shoes? Like what were they, what will be their advice to me as you know, someone that runs uh, a consulting group? Yeah, so because you know, you are in a very unique position, the consulting group, right? you talk talked to so many CISOs and so many security professionals and vendors as well. So how can we create a network effect so that that uh, it not only helps the companies like my company as well as you know other CISOs companies uh, that are in the portfolio of your consulting group. Um, so the, creating that particular network effect around and having a forum like these kinds of things will be some of one of the things, right? I mean, that I can suggest. Again, uh, you know, this is just a consideration. I strongly believe that the bad guy is outside of us. It's not another portfolio company. So let's say you're consulting with another company. That is not, I guess, you know, the, 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 you know, we don't have anything in common. Our both goals say is to protect from the bad guys, right? So they have similar challenges. So essentially, we need to be thinking about instead of being, how can I be faster than the other person? So this is a classic analogy of bear chase, right? So if you're in a forest with a bunch of, you know, people, bear chases you right mm -hmm. and if bear chases you uh, 
you want people typically say you don't want to run faster than the bear you want to be faster than the other person so that we <laughs> the bear catch other person right yeah. so the idea is not we don't want other person to be caught by bear as well right so how do we all win together against that particular bear is there a way to outsmart that particular bear together so I think uh, as a CEO of a consulting group, you have a very unique uh, you know, opportunity to create this network effect so that we all can together outsmart that bear. And thank you about that. And, and, usually, and you know, as we've discussed, uh, we're also like one of our goals is to create a network for CISOs to be managed by CISOs and you know, to be able to contribute to one another uh, and, and, and definitely that's one of my goals right now. Yeah. Okay. Switching uh, gears here. Uh, let's talk a bit about vendors. Um, yeah. and I know, you know, uh, well, as you know, I'm a vendor as well, and there are a lot of vendors there and especially now with LinkedIn and Facebook and, you know, all the social medias, I'm sure you get a lot of clutter. Uh, what's the most annoying sales pitch you've encountered? If you could narrow it to one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, basically the, the most annoying is, you know, again, you know, without naming it's, you know, if the salesperson is too pushing, right? I mean, I completely respect that we have to make sales. Right. I mean, we are also in the business of making money. Right. So I understand that the vendors are also and we need vendors. Right. So it's not that we cannot solve certain security problems if there were no vendors. Right. I mean, there are some good vendors and we, we want to partner and all that. We obviously respect them. But I think pushing the customer to the edge and continuously bothering is not going to help. Right. So I think um, there needs to be a line where the reason CISO is not responding is either that is not his priority or her priority um, at that particular point, because, you know, the CISO's hands are also tied. Right. I mean, there is a budget for everything. Lots of things fall below the line, above the line. Uh, so either, you know, the timing is not right or, you know, uh, it's just being too busy and respectful for, you know, not potentially returning the calls. But that to me is something is uh, one of the most annoying things is continuously pushing, um, being too pushy. And pushing to the edge where, you know, the vendors, they actually go all the way to the, you know, CEO of the company and it comes down and then there is tons of pressure over there. So, you know, that becomes very annoying. Yeah. And actually another CISO, uh, it's in another uh, podcast episode, actually, CISO of Carlsberg that I recently sp spoken to. He had one case with one of his prior vendors in a previous company where they actually, you know, as, as you just said, they went, ahead, they went up and talked to his boss and to HR and to his subordinates. And they told everybody that he, he told them to, to talk with them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you can imagine, they, they didn't end up signing any contract, obviously. Yeah, yeah. That's just, uh, just uh, bad business. Um, and, but you know, talking about like pushy sales pitches and pushy salesmen, what it is that you are looking for in a vendor? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that I'm concretely looking for, right? First thing is I'm not looking for a vendor relationship. I'm looking for partnership. And that partnership means that can that vendor be in CISO shoes? So I have talked, uh, you know, obviously I talked to multiple vendors. Um, and when I say that, hey, uh, by the way, you know, how do we solve this particular problem with your solution, right? Uh, some of the answers I get is that, hey, that's why I'm not in your shoes, right? I mean, uh, you know, some of you, you should be solving, I mean, in a pleasant way, obviously, you know, that it's your problem, you should be solving it. So 
obviously i should be i'm responsible for that but that is not a partnership right how do we solve together that hey there is an issue with the usage of that particular product right so um so one of the things that i think is that unless there is a ceo as an advisor or who has started a company uh, you know that company it's very difficult to feel the uh, feel it right the ceo kind of um, mentality right yeah um so uh, i have you know worked with uh, of one particular vendor i think you 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 know since you are asking for to share a story um and this particular uh, vendor were right i mean they quickly it was started by a former ceo this quickly resonated with uh, so much with the organization and then we had lots of stakeholder meetings you know across the organizations the stakeholders joined this meeting because you know as a ceo you not only have to um uh you not only have to sell it to yourself but you have to also sell it to the organization and the other stakeholders right so when you become um a partner in this relationship as a vendor and be there uh, you know the the adoption of the product becomes super easy so um that is that is one of the things is that how can you become more like a partner if you will yeah you know and i think personally i think working with vendors in the past and you know talking to colleagues i think it might be that some of at least some of, for for the for some part it might be the the fear of losing face or just admitting that you don't really know and yeah. as long as you can work to get, i mean i don't think a lot of vendors are willing to say look i'm not sure but if we work together we might be able to provide a solution we might not but you know as long as we keep the conversation open and honest and i think you know it's some for some sales people that might not resonate as a good strategy right i think you need to have a lot of confidence to say yeah i don't know i'm i'm not sure we might be able to solve it but we might not let's let's yeah. let's talk <laughs> yeah exactly and what happens is that when ceo brings a particular vendor into the organization he is also you know putting his yeah stake and the i i don't know. so uh, so that's why uh, it's very important to have that partnership and you know faith if you will yeah so and i mean it i think it goes back to trust right and m- most of the ceos i've spoken to you know at the end of the day it comes back to trust exactly yeah okay so so what would be your advice to vendors that do wish to connect with you but they want to attempt to do it in a non intrusive manner yeah so again uh, linkedin is the best way right i mean so there are two or three types of um vendors right in my opinion again so one is a particular field that potentially i have not i want to learn from the vendors as well right and what happens is that there are certain fields that ceos are so engrossed in blocking and tackling and navigating in the organization sometimes you know even being an avid non fictional uh, reader you know i might miss a particular trend in the organization uh, uh, in the industry so there is some if we start with an education material saying that hey this is a space and this is unique and communicating over the linkedin that will basically wet some interest in me as a ceo that oh there is something that i'm missing that i want to you know it's not the same space mm-hmm. or if you want to say that hey there is a differentiator right so i'm solving this particular problem and there are multiple vendors it can be a me to solution nothing wrong with it but in a very unique way so what is your differentiation can you do a short write up right as to why you are different more like an elevator pitch right that will get attention so something where there is an educational moment but in a non you know confrontational way and if there is a more like a differentiation that hey we are unique why because of this right mm-hmm. these are some attention grabbers in linkedin 
Uh, LinkedIn is the best way because I often check uh, my LinkedIn profile and that is the most non-intrusive yet attention grabbing way for me. Yeah. Uh, so if I want to sum it up, basically you want to be provided some value uh, at the get go and you, and, 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 and you need to see some kind of differentiator that stands out in the crowd. You're something right. to differentiate right away. yeah okay and learning moment and uh, attention uh, differentiate yeah. yeah um what would you say was the single most important thing to you in your career the single most important thing to me is good karma mm -hmm. and let me let me tell you uh, you know there are lots of lots of things that we can talk and include, right? I mean, integrity, honesty, hard work, big, you know, nice. But all these things are included in good karma, right? So th that means that how can I work with honesty is creating good karma, right? How can I work with integrity is creating good, good karma. How am I, I'm treating my colleagues, my peers in the company, how I work with vendors, in a very nice humble way right that is all creating good karma and it's more than that it's just how be how to be a better human being so that is the single most important thing to me in my career yeah and the reason i was smiling was not because i was laughing at you it's just that i came to a decision to found my company about 11 and a half years ago when I was attending a Kabbalah lesson. Uh, so, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Kabbalah, but uh, so it's like, you know, uh, it's like the, the Jewish mystical arts. So basically it's all, you know, it's all the same. The, the underline is all the same, you know, and you, said, uh, you, you mentioned good karma, the same principles apply, apply there as well. Um, but yeah, so def definitely that's the first, that's the first. Uh, that I've heard. Um, so moving on to a uh, couple of final questions before I let you go here. Um, uh, and this is, I think this is a type of a fun question. Uh, well, it's certainly fun to, to ask it, <laughs> but if you had, <laughs> if you had unlimited funds, what would you want to do with your life? Yeah. So, you know, I want to obviously eradicate poverty. All right, unlimited funds. We are talking of unlimited funds, right? I mean, just eradicate poverty, dedicate my life to giving back to the world, right? Because, you know, I don't have anything else to do, so I might as well do something good. The fundamental principle is that we want to leave the earth as a better place than what we got. Right? So, you know, the day I was born, have I made any impact to the earth where and the world where it is better than what I got, right? So if we follow that particular, you know, metrics, if you will, with the KPI and occur, mm -hmm. um, that is what I would, you know, that is what I would do. Okay, the, that's very noble. Um, I'm, hoping, uh, I'm hoping that would be the case, although, you know, <laughs> Looking at the world right now, I'm not sure it will be. I will leave it in a better place than what mm -hmm. I got it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we can only try um, so much. Um, and anything you'd like to share about like an interesting read or an interesting movie or a TV show, anything interesting that you've come, that you've came across lately? Yeah, I'm, I'm not into a, like, horror stories and horror movies or you know those kinds of things that basically scare me a lot <laughs> you know to be honest but uh, uh you know it gives me unnecessary blood rush but i i'm more into comedy light comedy you know so i, I really enjoy those kinds of things i also uh, like reading more philosophy and spiritual books, right? So one of the philosophical books is this complete works of Vivekananda. It's a nine volume series. It's free version on the internet. And it, you know, again, it is more philosophy driven as to it talks about 
uh, how one should look at life, right? So I'm very influenced as you might, you know, feel it and hear it from me. But uh, that is one of the things that I would recommend. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, I will put that name in the transcript of the of this podcast, the complete works of, not sure how I know how to pronounce it, Vi- Vivekananda. Yeah, you can say Vivekananda, yeah. Vivekananda, that's okay. You, that's how you do it, Vivekananda. Yeah. Vivekananda, okay, great. Um, so, so thank you, Apendra. I mean, this was fun. Uh, you certainly surprised me. You certainly surprised me with some of your answers and you know, it's always refreshing. And I love refreshing conversations. Uh, I do hope that we'll get a chance to talk with one another again, maybe even in person in one of the, you know, upcoming events once uh, some of the restrictions are lifted. Yeah. Um, and and maybe even, uh, you know, as, as we've spoken about connecting over that, that network that we're trying to create. Uh, uh, looking uh, forward to it, actually. Uh, looking forward to continue our partnership and also friendship. All right. Same, same here for me. Uh, thank you so much for now. That was a Pendra Mardikar. Uh, thank you. <laughs>